Oh, yeah, I have it recording and such. Oh, perfect. So, whenever you're ready, yeah. 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 Uh, this is our week two of uh, Badger Smart for financial uh, literacy and health and such. So, I'm going to do it here. Perfect. All right. So, we haven't met before. I'm Colton and I'm from Education Credit Union. Curious. I don't know if I really touched on this last time. Did I touch on this last time? What, what a credit union does? How we're different from that? Yes. Cool. So, all right, well, then we'll just dive right in. Credit unions are owned by their members, banks are owned by wealthy people. That's what you're doing, right? So, now, understanding credit. My question for you as we begin is what is credit? Your credit, credit score. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about those and what makes them up and how they're calculated. That's fun. But definitely to you, what is credit? Um, I think it's an overview of one person's work. Um, to see how well they manage their money and stuff that they owe. Very, very good. Stuff that they owe. There is like a really short D word for it. What is it? Yeah. There you go. That's all it is. Credit is a measure of how well you handle debt, ultimately. Now, there are a lot of financial experts, financial gurus who are insistent that you do not take on debt, that you don't take on any sort of credit. Why? 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 Hey, okay, so. Who in here was told never ever to get a credit card? <laughs> All right, so what so why is credit important? If you were told never ever to get one. Verbal. Louder for your friends. Louder for your friends. Uh, whenever you're ready to buy a home. That's the only thing in the whole wide world that you actually need a credit score for. If you want to buy a home, if you want to Correction, if you want to borrow money to buy a home, because like you know, if you want to buy a home and give your cash, by all means. But <laughs> if you want to borrow money to buy a home, the average cost of a home in Amarillo, Texas is $117,000 or more, something or less. The average cost of all the homes is $117,000, at least as of April. So if you want to save up cash for that, that's fine. But if you have no track record of borrowing and responsibly returning money, am I going to loan you $117,000? No, not in any universe. <laughs> so, so that is ultimately why credit is important. Um, do you need it? Do you need credit? Unless you don't have it. Do you need it to live? No. Do you need it to have a traditional lifestyle in American society? Yes. Very good. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Now, that we have that established. You don't need it to live, but you do need to have it to maintain a certain kind of lifestyle. So, what we recommend, not recommend, um, what I'm going to talk to you about, there it is. What I'm going to talk to you about is being a responsible borrower, because that's all it is. I like to think of credit as the game we all play, and I don't, I don't use say it's a game to minimize it, but there's some certain foundational things you have to understand about money. And the number one thing you have to understand is that 92, okay, so say you had every single bit of cash in the world. You had every coin, every drachma, every dollar, every pound, every ruble, every yen, every everything. You had all the cash money, the material money, coins and dollars in the world. You would have 8% of money. 92% of what we think of as money is numbers on a computer screen. It is imaginary. So it is sort of like a game. And the most successful people don't necessarily think of money as something they need to survive. It's a commodity. It is a resource that they can be traded and used and your whole, the whole game is increasing the amount of it that you have. All the rest of it is ancillary. Garrett's very simple. <laughs> and so now credit scores this is what makes up your credit score these five the moment. so everybody has a credit score if you ever borrowed money at any point in time you have a credit score great to follow you since kindergarten that 99 year old neighbor who's had a, who's had a loan at some point in her life has a like has a letter grade next to him on some piece of paper somewhere grades never escape you or you never escape grades better 
But these five components are what make up a credit score. What is payment history? Paying your bills on time every time. So paying your bills on time every time. That's the most important part. To illustrate it, you're in school. So let's use a test now. Um, say, oh, oh, here. So your credit score impact, what what is your credit score impact? You we know credit is, we know why we need it, right? Credit is a measurement of how well we can. Heather, I'm catching it. So credit is a measurement of how well we handle debt. And what do we need credit for? What is the one thing we actually need credit for? To live in the yeah, basically to, to borrow enough money to buy home, right? Ultimately, the one thing you need credit for, credit for, right? You want to borrow money to buy a home. And so, <clears throat> what does your credit score do for you? Isn't it where if you have a good credit score, you get like a lower interest rate, and if you have a high one, then you have a higher interest rate or something like that? Reverse kind of? it, yes. <laughs> yes. So oh, no, yeah, a, yeah, 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 exactly. Reverse. You have a high credit score, low interest rate, low credit score, high interest high, yeah. rate. There you go. Your credit score affects how much you actually pay for me. So, all right, how many of us, oh, well, okay, so how many of us remember being very, very young and you go to the store and, you know, your grown up hands you $5? That's your vision, $5 to go to the store. And you see something that is $4.99. Is that $5? No, and then how many of us remember being little and we went, our grown up <laughs> took us to the register with our $5 and our $4.99 item and we set it up on the counter and we're big, so we make our own first delivery of papers for the summer. So they're going to stand on the side after they're done. We're going to stand there. We're going to up there. And then we check it out across the counter. And she goes, your total is 541. And how many of us have been in that situation where you lean over to your person and go, I have a dollar for the tax? <laughs> how many of us have been in that situation? That was your first indicator, one of the earliest indicators, that the sticker price is not the price. Spoiler alert. The sticker price is never the price. You're going to borrow money to buy a home. You're going to borrow money, which means you're going to pay interest on that money, which means the cost of that home, whatever it is, says on Realtor.com or Trulia, is different, right? Because that's the sticker price, but you're eventually going to pay across 30 years or 15 more. Same thing with a car. You're in a car lot. You're going to borrow money for that car. So that's $40,000 equipment, $15,000, $10,000 vehicle. You're going to pay more. Than that, right? The sticker price is never the price. And when it comes to borrowing money, your credit score determines what the actual price is for you. It determines your interest rate. So the largest portion of what creates your credit score is payment history, paying your bills on time every time. And since we are in a school setting, we will use the test analogy. So say you want to get say the lowest interest rate on the home, but we'll use the school analogy. So we're saying the best rate in the class. So that way you can get whatever you want. So first three grades, first three tests, first three months, hundred, hundred, hundred. You're doing fantastic. Month four comes along, and for whatever reason, you skip the test. You miss the test. Something happens. Thirty-five minutes, hundred and sixty-five. You can still take the test. You can make a late payment. You can still take the test, but the highest grade you can make, assuming you do everything else correctly, is a sixty-five. It's the late payment. You made a late payment. So, how many more perfect hundreds is it going to take for you to get your grade up to a 99.5 that can be rounded up to 100 like you wanted to? The answer is 13. It's a lot of math. But that's the illustration. 13 perfect hundreds. No other grades, no other anything else to get it back up to where you want it to be. That's not getting it to an A, that's, not, that's getting it back to 99.5. But you see how much work that takes versus the one time you were just you made a late payment. Payment history sticks with you. We talk a lot of people when they talk about credit, they talk about when things fall off. I have a tendency to use that verbiage because it's what I grew up hearing, but things don't fall off. Like we can see like back ten years on your credit history. What we <coughs> when I'm teaching points is what I say is when things cease to negatively impact you. We can see what happened, but it no longer has a negative effect on your credit score. Starting around month 25, two years, it will negatively impact you, getting less and less and less until month 25, it ceases to negatively impact you at all in any way. We can just see, oh, they made a late payment two years ago. Cool. Good question. 
Payment history is important because that is the fastest thing that will lower your credit score, a late payment or a missed payment. And it will lower it for that line of credit. So your car that you borrowed money for is a line of credit. Your credit card is a separate line of credit and your home will be a third line of credit. Those are three different lines. You can make your house payment on time, you can make your car payment on time, but if you make your credit card payment late, then that will negatively impact that line of credit by 35%. But that one will affect the other two, but in less of a way, right? So the more lines of credit you have, the kind of has that dampens the effect of that single mess up, right? But at the same time, the more lines of credit you have, the more juggling you're doing. So, all right, in history, first and foremost, here goes on the map, you're not most important thing. The next thing is amount owed. The amount that you owe is 30% of your credit score. And so the best way to look at it is say you have a credit card with a limit of $1,000. Say you've charged up $990 of that. How much do you have left to spend? $10, right? Yeah, so $1,000, $990 you charged. And so you have $10 left. Let's, let's, you have $10 of wiggle room. Is that a lot of wiggle room out of $1,000, $10? $10? No. You owe. Most of you, like you, you have nine hundred ninety dollars out there that you owe somebody, and your credit limit is a thousand. That is going to negatively impact your credit score. We want to see wiggle room. The amount, the more you owe someone else, the more your credit score is going to go down, especially for particular lines of credit. So, on um, unsecured lines of credit, there is an amount that you can safely spend on unsecured lines of credit. Or continue forward. Said unsecured. So there's two kinds of credit. There's secured and unsecured debt. What is the difference? Besides the premium. What happens if you borrow money from me for a car and so you come to me like, hey, I need a car. I'm like, hey, cool. I'm like, I need twenty thousand dollars. I'm like, hey, cool. And so that's not how it goes, but you know. And so I'm gonna loan you twenty thousand dollars at such and such interest rate. And what if you don't pay me that money that I gave you for that car that you bought? What do I do? I can mess up your credit first because you missed the payment. So it's gonna, you're going to mess it up on your phone. I don't. But there's not a magic button I push. There's just, the computers do it. So it just it goes down. But what am I going to do after like a couple months? Secured then. Secured and unsecured is for financial institutions for the lender. It's secured on my end. There's something that I can take back and sell to somebody else to get my money back that I loaned you. I loaned you money for it, you're not going to pay me for it? Well, I'm going to take it from you and sell to somebody else to be able to get you for it. That's secured. But you use your credit card, and can I take back that night out of the movies with friends? Can I take back that, you know, to, you know, first arrow is okay, but I don't know. Whatever it is you do with your credit card, can I take any of that back? Not yet. But, <laughs> and so but what I can do with unsecured lines of debt. The interest rate is generally higher because it's a higher risk to, for you to use that money because there's nothing we can take back. So there's going to be a higher interest rate on those unsecured lines of credit, like your credit card. But then also it's going to take your credit score way down. Much better. There is a safe amount you can spend on unsecured lines of credit when it comes to amount mode. So going back to that credit card we had for $1,000, the magic percentage of what you can sit, spend safely unsecured lines of credit is around 40%. So out of a thousand dollar credit limit, you can safely spend around $400. Okay. And so, and then you have to pay that $400 back like, oh, as soon as possible. But you can use that and then that 40% and it won't negatively impact you, but it will start beginning to negatively impact you after you use that 40%, especially if you do not pay it off. Amount mode is tricky. This is the part where I say it's a game. Hold on. This is not wise to do, but if you are clever and savvy and back into the corner, this is what people can do. So, that credit card that's $1,000, we charge $990 on it, we have $10 left. Now, we make all of our other payments on time. We have a lengthy credit history of prior things that we paid off cars, we paid off, it's good. So we have a history, so you have a good leg. Here's a credit is good, generally speaking, just that amount of we have we borrowed a lot. 
and we haven't paid it all back yet, you're still going to get offers for credit cards. And do people with D credit still get credit cards? Yes. Yes, they do. Is their interest rate level really, really high? Yes. And do people with C credit still get credit cards? Yes. Is their interest rate really, really high? Yes. So you're still going to get credit card offers. Even though you might borrow $990 worth of your $1,000 credit card, you're going to get offers for another credit card. And that other credit card is going to be worth $2,000. You know what? What the heck? So you're going to take out that $2,000 credit card. Now, your total debt threshold is $3,000. And you've only borrowed $990 of that. <clears throat> is that less than 40%? Yeah. Have you eliminated any debt at all? No, you just raised your debt ceiling. So it looks like, it looks a lot better. That's part of the game, right? You haven't done anything except open yourself up to more debt, but it looks good on your credit score, right? Because now you're not spending, you know, 99.2% of your debt, right? You're gonna think you haven't borrowed against yourself by that much. Now it's less than 40% and it looks a lot better. Don't do that. That is it. If you run up $99, you're gonna go like, I'm gonna take out more credit cards. That is not wisdom. Like, that's not what you're doing. But if you are back into a corner, that is a way to avoid further trouble if you can be responsible and like hand it to somebody else and just say, hey, we paid this off. All right. Now, new credit. Yes, we'll go to new credit. Each and every time your credit score gets checked, it is a hit on your credit. New credit is new lines of credit, new lines of credit that you open. So, and every time your credit is checked, it can continue up to 10% on a particular line of credit. There is a very popular service that is often advertised that says you can check your credit score at any time without any sort of penalty. What is the service? There it is. Credit Karma. That's awesome. Okay, so who likes math in this room? Good. Okay. So <laughs> now, credit card. Do you know how your credit score is calculated? Like the number, how it spits out these grades that we all look at here with people. Oh, look at right now. So you know how it spits out one of these grades? Like what the math equation is to do that? There is one. That's how you get numbers, math. And so, do you know that? Do you know what that algorithm is? Nobody does, except the people who made it at the Fair Isaac Corporation, FICA. Fair Isaac Corporation, FICA. Okay. So the Fair Isaac Corporation created their own math problem, their own equation, their own algorithm, based on these five factors, given this percentage of weight. So 10% for new credit, 30% for not owed, oh, their top six in the industry and a variety of other factors. But these are the factors that impact your credit score, but a variety of other things that go into this algorithm. And then that mysterious math equation spits out one of your grades, okay? Spits out your grade that sits next to your name until it changes. Nobody knows what that is. The law legally declared we have to know what makes up our credit score, which is why I can tell you about these five things. But we can't, we don't know what the math equation is. What credit card did was there are three credit bureaus in the United States, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. TransUnion and Experian, is Equifax, one of the evils. TransUnion and one of the others got together and said, hey, we can create a similar math equation. But what we can do is we have Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express advertise on our website. So they'll pay us to advertise their products. And what we'll do is just have people enter their information and we'll just run it through that math problem that we made and give them kind of a credit score that's similar to the one that they can see when they walk into the financial institution. And then when they're on our website, they're going to be advertised on these credit card offers and be told their approval on That'll really get them looking. That'll make them shop for credit that they can afford. Then, so Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express are winning customers and credit card is getting traffic. And of course, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express are paying credit card for all this traffic that they're getting. And so it's a win, win, win. You get to kind of sort of know your credit score and, you know, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover all get new customers and credit card gets money. Is similar the same? No. Credit card is a really useful tool. I highly recommend you run your stuff through there just to make sure your name isn't being used, everything isn't true. Because what happens is if you report one error to one credit bureau, they are legally required to report it to the other two. So you can like, oh, I never lived at this address. If it's saying that I did at some point, that's weird. Submit that, they'll fix it. You can see if there is a credit card out there in your name somewhere. That's useful. It happens. 
people's credit cards or people's social security numbers stolen in their teenagers and they don't know until they're like 28 trying to buy a house and like, oh, well, you got a loan in your name that's never been paid. Like, that's a thing that happens. So credit card is useful for that. It is useful for giving you a ballpark credit score. Sometimes it's in the outfield. I've seen it be up to 40 points different. That's letter grade. Like a 702 is just 35 is an A. That's more, that's, I've seen it be 40 points different. That also seem to be like five, 10 points different, which can be a letter grade, it can be another way. But it is not the same. Now, one really cool thing, the only website that is federally mandated to give you an accurate credit report is annualcreditreport.com. And what's really cool as a result of the pandemic and everything going on is that you can go to annualcreditreport.com every week and get a free accurate credit report without penalty to you. So until April, 2021. So until April of next year, every single week, you can go to annualcreditreport.com and pull your credit report. It won't give you your score, it will, but it will give you all of your information and history and your score can be pulled by your financial institution of choice, okay? So annualcreditreport.com is the way to go, but Credit Karma in future can be really useful as an information tool. Don't think it's going to spit out an accurate number for you. You will be disappointed. You could be happily surprised, but I've always, not always, I've generally seen it in the movie the direction. So now, new credit each and every time. So if you've ever been shopping for a vehicle, specifically a used vehicle, you will hear somebody go, well, can we just run your credit real fast? We just want to make sure you can make the payment. Yeah. And do you just go to one dealership? No. So what's going to happen is that every time your credit report is ran, every time your credit is pulled, it dings. Ding, ding, ding. And so you go to like nine different dealerships. That's nine different dings. But then what happens is that eight, nine months later, when you're at your financial institution of choice or you're applying for a credit card and credit karma, what that person is going to see when they pull your credit report is, oh, well, there are nine hits on their credit in the last year, in the last six months, in the last five months. Oh, but oh, they went car shopping. That's fine. Circle them all. What we do? Circle them all. Count them as well. Put it back in. So when they say it's a soft pull, unless you're not pulling the credit, like soft pulls are very different than actual credit report pulls. So whenever we do that, like I say, just know that when your credit is checked, it does impact your credit score. You want to hover around two credit inquiries per year, max, unless you're, you know, you, you know, need something or unless you're shopping. Why? Why would we kind of sort of frown upon people asking, checking for more credit often? Could you because they think they're going to borrow up more money or something? Perhaps. Do we need credit to live? We need credit to participate in a certain lifestyle within our society. So, if you need to borrow money, I'm going to wonder what you're doing with your own money that you earn and why you need to borrow money. And the more you're shopping, things like the more you're pulling or shopping for credit, that tells me that you need money. And it's not that, like, again, this, is, this facilitates a lifestyle. It is not a need. And that is something many, 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 many people need to grasp that it is sort of a game. And there's a safe way to play and a safe way to play. You can get yourself in big trouble really fast. It's just like a payment. If you're missing one payment, it really throws you off for a period of time. It can really negatively impact you. So when it comes to shopping for credit, keep it minimum as possible. There's no reason, unless you're like shopping for a car, shopping for clothes on a home, things like that, that even then your home lender you know, maybe I'm shopping for a couple of those, and then because you're going to get kind of some of the same information, and then car dealerships are the one time where we're like, oh yes, like they've been to 12 different dealerships because they live in Dallas, so there's 800 of them. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of when we like, oh, but there should be no reason we see like 10 different credit card inquiries. Length of credit history that works in your favor. The longer you've had credit, generally speaking, the better credit somebody has. Also, whenever you take out length of credit and new credit sort of work together, whenever, say you have one credit card and you got it two years ago, well then 
Now you're going to get another credit card. The average age of that lowers the average age of the credit because now you have a new one that's just born that goes that's now the age is average with your two year old card. And so it kind of brings it down. But then the longer it goes along, and the more you have, it sort of expands out. Length of credit history impacts you by 15%. We're going to be curious. Um, Oh, you've had credit for 35 years, but you've never bought a car before. We're going to ask you questions. We'll talk about asking questions for sure. Credit mix. This will be the only time you hear me use an athletic metaphor. So, how many of us remember those people, like from high school, who were really good at football but couldn't play basketball? Or how many people who could really play baseball but they can't skip? Right? You're really good at one thing, but you can't do the other thing. Financial institutions are looking for an all around that, looking for that mix of credit. We're looking at a mix of secured and unsecured debt to see how reliable you are. You might handle a car payment great, but that, that, that's not revolving debt. That's not a credit card. That's not a, you don't know what you're running up your charges for, so can you handle unsecured debt? Or you've only ever had a credit card. We don't know if you can handle a mortgage. And so and we'll, we'll talk to your lender and they'll ask you a lot of questions. But while we're seeing credit mix impacts you by 10%, and just the more lines of credit you have, especially if they're different types, like energy, finance, the credit card, the student loan, the whatever, the more we see that floating around, the more it works a good thing. Again, credit grades, A plus all the way to E, what letter do you not see? F, except it's just when they get an F. And so E credit, people can still get loans, not the loan they want the amount that they want, not the interest rates that are working in their favor. But in certain instances, from certain lenders, depending on the situation and what it's for, you can still borrow money. It is not wise if you have a credit. Everybody, I know, I can say everybody, at Education Credit Union, our members typically start that they have no established credit history and are trying to, we write them in as a C. We don't know if you don't pay your bills, we don't know if you do pay your bills, so you get an average C. And then your score can go up or down, depending on your behavior. Every single one of these is a different interest rate on somebody's rubric in their office. They're going to see your credit score and they're going to go to that page, this month page, because it changes every month. They're going to look at that interest rate based, and that's your extra amount. That's what you're paying. This impacts how much you would actually spend on stuff. So let's look at it. I think I have an illustration here. All right, so it's interest. Like I say, that's how financial institutions make money. We established this before. Um, every single loan, again, nothing is the sticker price. Interest is the cost of borrowing them. That is how we keep our lights on. That's how I get paid. Right? All the people at Educate, the 29,000 members we have at Education Credit Union, many of them have loans. But all of those loans have interest, and those interest rates stay within the credit union because we're credit union. And then that's how I'm paid. That's what pays our electric bill. That's what does all the stuff. Right? Our supplies, our good, whatever. And so that is the most important thing for you to consider when you are borrowing money. Not the price, not anything else. But the most interest, important thing you can consider is your interest rate. And when you're shopping, you're not shopping for a cheaper price, like on sticker price, you're shopping for a cheaper interest rate because it's how much you're going to pay over time. So we have Henry and Maria. They're going to pretend they're in alternate universes. They have the exact same job. The exact same everything. They're wanting to buy the exact same home, and they're also going to put a zero down payment on it. There's ways to do that, but we're not going to talk about But for the purposes of this exercise, they're doing a zero down payment on their home, and they're buying the exact same house, they have the exact same job, make the exact same amount of money. The only thing that's different about Henry and Maria are their credit scores in these alternate universes. How much more? The price is $120,000 for that home. How much do you think Henry will actually pay at the end of that 30 year mortgage? What was the actual price of the home? 160. 160? The price is right. Push this camera. 180. 180? 170. 170. All right. Now, Maria, her credit score is a 760, which is an A. Plus. She's also. You know, that's $120,000 home. Now, even though her credit score is an A, plus, she's still going to pay interest. She's still going to borrow money and pay interest on that home. So, how much do you think she'll pay? Like 140. 140. <laughs> the 
this is based on current rates. I got this from a mortgage girl like two weeks ago. Or so <laughs> I just updated these numbers. These are the rates. At the end of 30 years, Henry will have totally paid $212,000 for his $120,000 home. Maria, at the end of 30 years, assuming she doesn't prepay, assuming she doesn't refinance, all of those other factors being considered, she's going to pay $196,000 for that home. She's still going to pay around $77,000 in interest, $77,000 extra dollars. That's just the cost of borrowing money. Now, here's going to be $92,000 for that home. That's a, that's a big difference. That's around $16,000. I can't do math this week. I'm sorry, it's a week. On Thursday, it's a stressful week. But so it's $16,000 difference. What can you do with $16,000? And the only thing that was different is our credit score. If Henry had waited and built up his credit score, it can be done, and you can do it in relatively short order as long as you're responsible, pay off all your stuff, and all that. He could have brought it up to an A plus. It might have cost him a couple extra years on the front side, but it would have saved him sixteen thousand dollars. Is it worth it? <laughs> and that depends on you. Remember, your money is your own, and what you do with it is your business. But again, I can think of several things I can do. And so, that is how interest works. That is whenever you borrow money, you get into debt, that's how it works. Now, how much debt you can afford is the question that your lender is asking themselves. That's one of our very first questions. Even once we've seen your credit score and pulled your credit, we're going to look at how much debt you can afford. The number one reason that we deny a loan is because of someone's debt to income ratio. And debt to income ratio has nothing to do at all with your credit score, period. But it is the number one reason that people are denied loans. So, debt to income ratio is where we take a look whenever you apply for a loan, whether it's for a car, for a home, for whatever. What we're going to have you do is list your bills. We're going to see, like, your income, we're going to pull your credit report, so we'll see those bills, who you owe credit, who your creditors are. We'll see those. But then, if it's a home or something large, we'll see, like, proof of income, like the tax returns and all that stuff. But what we're going to do is break it down into your monthly credit card payments, anything that you owe anybody else. And we're going to add all that up. And we're going to do the math based on your income. Because we do that. So like that's your credit card, everybody asks, what, how much money do you make? And then if you owe more people, or too many people, based on the income that you have, we're not going to make you owe us too. Your debt to income ratio is like at 98%. You can't afford it. Because is somebody's grocery grocery bill in here? What are pet expenses? What about their rent? Because there's a mortgage here, but is your rent factored into your credit score? No. Not unless you ask them. So this person has a mortgage, but if you don't have a mortgage, you just pay rent. And that's not reported on the credit score. And so we have to think about that. Well, there's no rent. And there's that we have all of these bills, and then okay, well, they're not a homeowner, so they're renting. They also have to get groceries, they also have to have drinks, and they have pets, and they have children. How can they afford another bill? I'm so sorry, sir. Unfortunately, we're not able to afford the loan at this time, but what we can't, your debt to income ratio was around 47%, and that's just a little high based on what we're seeing. It varies from person to person based on their amount of income that they make, but debt to income ratio. Even with a good credit score, it can deny you a loan. It would be very rare, but it can happen. Debt to income ratio definitely comes into play, though. And so that's one thing you need to keep an eye on. Your gross monthly income, how much money you make overall. Your net, of course, is what you get to bring home. It's gross, how much you have to give away in taxes. And the net is what you get to bring home. So we're going to look at your gross monthly income and calculate all your bills out of that. And then factor in your debt to income. Look at your debt to income ratio. And is there room for you to have another bill? Yes or no? So you go on. It depends, but yes, generally speaking, yes. Now, debt to income ratio can also help you. This is when your conversation with your lender comes into play. So, are you just the one paying rent? Oh, how much is your rent? Or, oh, how much is your mortgage? Are you just the one paying these credit card bills? No, 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 we split this bill. Or, oh, no, no, this is, oh, no, that's actually my grandma's. So they do that. But we can make adjustments. That's when you, when you can. People get kind of like defensive when they're like a lender asks them questions. Personal, I'm going to see thousands of dollars. But 
not only that, it's one of those, but we're trying to determine my boss. She teaches a reading the credit bureau report class for our employees. So if you're a lender in education, we will like facilitate kind of the business stuff. But then what how she always concludes every single one is our former CEO loved doing it, was just remind them that 99% of people pay back their loans. 99%. So at education credit union, we have an where assets are around 300 million dollars. That means we have 300 million in reserve. Our collections department, asset protection. Our collections department calls in about a million, a million dollars of outstanding like past due on collections. You know, about a million, three hundred million to one. People pay back their loans. We know people are reliable. We're not going to overburden someone with like a high debt taking ratio. We want to make sure you pay back that loan. So we're going to give you another bill if you don't think you can't. And if we have that conversation with you. Those conversations, asking those intrusive questions, we're trying to make that decision. We're trying to, okay, so, oh no, they don't have that. So this is OCD, this judgment. And then the other person, well, yeah. And then, like I told you before, like that guy who, you know, needed money for a kid's Christmas presents. Knowing that history can matter and mean the difference between a yes or a no and a loan, right? That's how that goes. Building credit is where people get into trouble because, okay, so I'll tell you my story. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, what was the equation for the oh. oh, you're fine. It was just hard to see it. I know, it's very, it's like it's okay. So, to, it's, we just basically take your debt, uh, yeah, we take out of all your credit, or your, your bills mm -hmm. that are submitted to credit, where you make payments to, and then you take your gross monthly income. So you divide how much you owe versus how much you make, and that is your debt Okay. All right. Now, so I was 19 long ago. I got some tough folks. And I was a superlative student in school. I was a really good kid. I never did anything wrong. Like still kind of a little bit. And so, but it's hard to shake. But yeah, <laughs> I was one of those good teachers kids. And then, <laughs> and uh, my mother always told me, my mother, my mother was a single mother, she really, really struggled growing up, um, as I was growing up, and it, it was interesting to watch, I say interesting, I was an adult, um, it was interesting to watch her, because she bent over backwards to make sure that I had everything that I needed, and I was, in, it was, I was a junior high, I was so, like, you know, in, in dire straits, we were, there were a couple of instances when I was really young, I was some sort of flat tire, and how much trouble that was, and how much, like, big tang and ramen, but, Outside of that, everything was pretty good until junior high when you start to become cognizant of certain things. You're like, oh yeah, no, we're cool. Okay, gotcha. And so you keep moving. But uh, she always told me never ever, never ever get a credit card. I'm sure you have one. 14, it's not going to happen anyway. It doesn't matter to me. But then I was 19 and I was in school full time. I was working full time. Felt very accomplished. I was living on my own. Like, it was a golden time, and it was so proud. You know how mom now tells how I'm doing. So proud of you. And I got a credit card off in my mail. I remember, like, Nana said, mom can never get a credit card. Okay, but because I'm the first one to college, and I'm doing all this stuff, like, I'm doing everything right. So maybe, and I knew when I moved into my apartment, they said they wanted to check my credit score, and I'm like, well, I don't have one, but okay, you got me, I've had it. And so, well, then I knew as an adult that I needed credit, like to do, you know, participate in traditional American life. And so I was like, well, I can get a credit card. It's not the same thing. I'm not going to max it out or charge it up. I just need it to establish a credit history. I knew that much. Just enough to get interest. So I got my credit card from my financial institution of choice that offered me, like, I had a scholarship to go to WT, but then, like, there was a little bit that didn't cover in my later years. And so my junior, senior year. And so I was like, well, I got a student loan person. This is old. And so I got my credit, my, my credit card from the financial institution of choice for my student loans. And life was all good. That was during the summer. My credit card arrived the week after my birthday, and I took myself a birthday shop. And not bad. The limit, I remember, because the limit was $900. That's And so I went to the mall. And I bought two shirts, a pair of shoes, and a bag, like a crossbody bag, because it was popular back then. 
And so, cross my back, two shirts and a pair of shoes. And it's cologne, kind of full reaction, still can't sit. Good now, but it cost me a whole lot of headache. Because at the end of the summer, school started back up. And I couldn't work as often. And I was a key holder at the mall. And my manager was like, hey, you know, part of my scholarship was being on campus in my, you know, my crazy theater. So, my, like, part of it was being on campus, being in shows, which meant I couldn't work in place. And I'm in school during the day. School pulls up. Oh, that's great. But if you can't be here, be a key holder and, like, open and close, or open and more close, and you kind of need somebody who can. You can still be an associate. Cool. Is that key holder then? And just like that, overnight, I could barely afford the apartment that I just moved into. And barely afford gas between Amarillo and Canyon because I was sat in church apartment in Amarillo versus going to school. All those little mistakes that you don't realize that you're making when you're 19 years old. And then my first credit card bill came in. And I did what my mom always did. And I watched her do it in real. Well, if you can't afford it, don't pay it. What are they going to take? Fair enough. I'm struggling enough to beat myself, struggling enough to get gas, to go to work, and go to class. So, you know what, that credit card, those two shirts, and that bag, and those pair of shoes, shh, I'll pay it when I can. Pay it when I can. So they grew up in the mom. Never got paid. Comes December. I have one year of school left, like spring semester, fall semester, I've been in December graduate. One year, two semesters. And so I call my financial institution of choice, get a student loan for that next semester. And talking to this woman on the phone, she's very pleasant. I'm like, hey, like this is my number, you know, gives me all your information. She pulls you up. I'm like, hey, yeah, last year of school, just you know, two more, just like you know, give me two more semesters. I'm really excited. I just need this new loan, just the same amount, just reading it or do have whatever. It's like, oh, okay, da, da, da. oh, and then the tone changed. I see the credit card fee that you haven't paid off in the last six months. You're gonna need that fee in full before we can distribute any. Because I had no money. I was, I just paid my phone bill and turned it back on so I could call the student loan people. And so, and I spent around $400 on my credit card. Who did I call? Um, your mother. <laughs> I called the Nana, my mom's me. And so, I called my Nana. And I say that, I always make that joke. Call my Nana because my mom's me. My mom is, is a very stern woman. She's hilarious, but cool, excuse me. But um, my mom always has financial struggles. And it was, I knew how the conversation would go. She would yell at me, and I would get in trouble. But you're 19, you're not going to get in trouble. But what was going to happen is that she was going to do what she'd always done, which is bend over backwards to make sure I'm square. And she would go with us. She would hurt herself to make sure that I don't. And now, this was something that she warned me about sometimes about and told me not to do. And then I didn't go behind her back. I'm an adult, I can make my own decisions. But I didn't say, hey, guess what I did? And listen to the, you shouldn't have done that, but now here's what to look out for. I went about past all that because I do everything right and I don't need to worry. But sometimes things happen. Things that you don't foresee. So I called Nana. And Nana wagged her finger at me. But Nana is in, is, was, in a more financially stable place. She was able to rescue me. And then she put me on my very first and a very strict budget. And I was able. What was, and Nana drove this point home to me, and I'll never forget it. She was called it. You, since kindergarten, you were that kid. Goodbye to all expectations. Always make a grade, never got to. My, the worst thing on a report card is talks too much. It's a bright number. And so, straight A's from kindergarten literally through high school. I got a B in geometry for three, six weeks in a row, sophomore year. I'll never forget this rate. But you were doing all of this in your last year. And now you're going to mess it up. Now we worked, you worked so hard. And now you're going to do this. If, if I, but if she were not financially capable, what would I do? 
What would you do, Colton? If I couldn't do this for you, what would you do? I don't know. And now, I, as a financial educator, I know that there are options available to me, but I do not know that then. And I do know how to go about finding them. And that's part of why I do what I do and why I enjoy what I do, because all my whole job is telling you things that I wish I knew when. You know? It can hurt you. Credit can hurt you. It can really help you too. Knowing with how to build credit appropriately, not getting a secret credit card when you're a teenager. <laughs> Which you can't get a credit card now. Again, this is how old I am. Um, you can't get a credit card now without a co signer until you're 21. So I was 19. So <laughs> I'm part of that decision. But, um, but you know, my name is me, not everybody is as fortunate. And so if you want to build credit, you don't have to take out a credit card with a high amount or anything like that. You can start as simple with a secured credit card. Remember the difference between secured and unsecured debt? A secured credit card functions technically the same way as a debit card. You're going to walk into your financial institution of choice. Every single financial institution offers something like this, a secured credit card. I believe across the board, the minimum opening is $300. So if you want a secured credit card, then hand your financial institution of choice $300. And say, I would like a secured credit card. Don't take your $300 and don't put it in an account. And that $300 becomes your credit limit. You're going to then use that card as you would a credit card. You're going to not use more than 40% of that $300. And you're going to pay it off every single month, like down to zero, every single month. The best way to do it is to get gas. And um, this is your gas card. And you're going to pay it at the end of every single month. Because if you do use less than 40% of what you're allowed to borrow and you pay it off every single month, your credit score can go up two points a month. You don't have to be elaborate. You don't have to over borrow, over extend yourself, or max out anything. And you're going to be tempted, oh my goodness, to have fun, to have an art out. And by all means, if you have the discipline, do so. The best thing to do is if you have, if you're going to spend, the fun money. If you're going to get a credit card, even a secured one or any credit card, and you could try building credit, don't spend what you don't have in the bank. Just look at your checking account, and that is what you can spend on your credit card. Because then, then you go get gas. Well, you, you would have got that with your debit card anyway, right? So just get your gas, and then immediately, you know, wait the next day, let it post, and then, you know, it shows activity, it keeps your account active, and you're good. And if you're going to wait and go have fun with your friends and go out to a restaurant, go to movies, whatever, look at your checking account. Do you have enough money to do that without a credit card? If yes, do the thing, wait a week or two, pay off. Because you would have used your debit card anyway. But if you're spending more than what you have in your checking or saving, you are inviting trouble. Make all of your payments on time. Set an alarm in your phone. Make it automatic. Every financial institution of choice has an online payment system. Chase Visa does not mind an automatic payment. They'll take it out before you see it. Like, well, not before you see it, but you know what? It's going to hit. They'll take it out on a specific day. You can designate the day. I know that I always have money on the 22nd of every month. Then that's, that's when the bills come out. That's when you know you have money then. Well, I know that I can make this payment at that time. And that way, it's already claimed, it's already done. Set it and forget it. Bill pay saves a lot of people a lot of trouble because not only do late payments hurt your credit score, they are also more expensive. There are late fees involved. Right? So, building credit can be easy. My, my roommate in college, she um, she got a bed. She like when she only wanted like a big fancy bed. Again, this is longer. But these are before Casper mattresses. And so she's one of the big, like a nice bed. You know, she came to college and we all, like, you know, we all came and went to, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to be a master, so you have a high school or whatever. And so we all loaded her stuff up because she got, like, her own very first bed. And they are, like, you know, expensive. But they like, finance it. And that was her only thing. She didn't have a credit card. She didn't have any of that stuff. It was $26 a month. Easy for a take. She had established credit history. It's closed ended. The one thing about that is with financing with places like that, say you want to buy that and that's how that will establish a credit score for you. What will happen though is that once you've paid off whatever it is, especially at furniture places, it actually happened to me, but 
when they close that out, that closes the account. When you close an account, it goes away, and that lowers the average age of your credit. Remember that length of credit history that's 15% of your credit score? So if you pay on this debt for three years, you have three years of credit history, and that's your only thing. And then it's paid off in three years, month 37, that's gone. And then it vanishes. And then you don't have any more credit history to build on. And so you know, it hits you. It's, neg it's a negative impact. So whenever people like, when I remember my mom, when I was a junior in high school, she paid off her last credit card. She was so excited. And she called, and like, she paid it off, made the last payment, and then she immediately called them and said, I want to close out the account. Now, mom, no, don't do it. Keep it open, cut off the card, never look at it, never see it again, whatever. It'll close itself out without some activity after a few months. But if you close out accounts, it ceases calculating that history for you. And you, your average age of your accounts declines. Longer length of credit helps you. Okay. Now, let's look at some credit reports really fast. This is a very nice and colorful version of what we actually see. Credit reports, depending on your length of credit history. Because again, we see from the earliest time you ever borrow. One of the things we teach people in reading credit reports is social security numbers. Because if you're born in, after the mid to late 1980s, you got a social security number when you were born. But people were born before that time, they usually got a social security number when they got their first job. And so when we see, like, when we're look, looking for red flags, like, well, your social security number was issued in that thing, like, you. And so we look for those things. And so one of the things, so we see from the time you first ever borrowed money all the way to the present. And it's a stack of papers, or it's like a couple of sheets of paper. Today. This is the cover. It is your name, your basic information, and in big letters, your letter grade, and your credit score, like the number, the grade itself. And then we see like an overview, like here they have at the bottom. Past due, remember things cease to negatively impact you in month 25. So in the last two years, Anastasia hasn't had a late payment or a missed payment. We know this. Cool. And she's had, let's look again, length of credit, 15 years with the credit. So she's had 15 years, a credit history of 15 years. But then, she, in the last two years, not a later missed payment. So she's doing great so far. I'm seeing that her credit score is there, so I'm looking for where that's coming from. Credit inquiries four. Huh. Number one, it's around two. But, you know, sometimes people are shopping for specific things. It just depends. Her debt ratio, 72%. So that's when we have a conversation with Anastasia. I see you have a vote. <laughs> Here are the pay people? Okay. So, uh, I mean, do you, do you make those vote payments? How is that? Uh, oh, no, that's just in my name. It's for my brother, and he couldn't afford it at the time. So I got it for him, but like, he makes the payments on it. Oh, okay, cool. And so, mortgage, credit card, student we go through all those questions. And then, you know, we see people like here at the time. She has two missed or late payments. We don't know what on the actual credit report when we're looking through the pages we can see, but on the cover, we just see she's either missed or had a late payment twice. Um, 20 credit inquiries, and she's only had credit for two years. And between her mortgage credit card and medical debt, she has a 67% debt. debt Medical debt, I can say at Education Credit Union, we don't count. Most, and I will say, I will say most, I will say I know of other lenders that also do not consider medical debt in determining your credit score. It used to be a thing, but it is no longer a thing for many, many lenders. Now, 20 credit inquiries, I'm going to look and see she's car shopping, I'm going to look and see like, what we're doing, like watch 20. For all, this is all for credit cards, this is all for personal loans, and what, you know, what's, why are we applying for credit right now, here today? I'm going to ask all those questions. Does she end up with a mortgage and all that stuff? So all of them have a fair credit rating. These are not the same names, but these are actual people and their spending habits. All of them got their loans. You are more than a number, always. Money is not the most important thing in the world outside of the financial institution. And so, like, and so, 
talking to your vendor. Even though your credit is doing that little sketch, you might not be. You might look that way, but it might not be. And that's what your vendor is trying to discover when they talk to you. If there are some poor decisions made, your lender will most likely have solutions for you. Especially if you seem like a type like amicable, like you're on the phone, you're like, yeah, I know, it's kind of like, we want to talk to you. And like, you know, we can't approve you the loan right now, but here's what we can do. Or here's something you can try. So we're gonna give you advice. I don't take that advice really up. But what we can say are here's some helpful tips. And once you've done this, you know, for the next six months, if you do this, this, and this, we can revisit this and, and open it back up and see where we're at then. But until then, I would try these things. We do that often for the people that aren't screaming at us. And so, but, does that happen? But you're always more than enough. You are, your credit history, all of that stuff, there is nothing broken that cannot be fixed, especially financially. Money is one of the most abundant resources in the world. And so, it might take time, it might take a lot of discipline, but there is nothing broken that cannot be fixed, especially when it comes to your credit. Remember that your credit score only impacts you here, in the United States. This is, in terms of worldwide global scale, your credit score is a small thing that is easily managed, as long as you discipline yourself and don't overextend, as long as you know what you're doing. And not know like how to do things, but like know that it is sort of a game. And you pay your bills on time, you don't overextend yourself, you don't overbrow. Like this is just a tool for you to use to get what it is that you want. How a budget is just a tool that you use to get what it is that you want. That's all any of this stuff is. It's just a an economic tool. Okay. Now, questions, comments, concerns before we go? Yes, of course. I have read on social media and you entered into one of your accounts um, when they're young, when they're older, they'll have good credit. Yes, that is a thing that happens. So, um, they're, they're called PCOA codes, but yes. So, whenever somebody does that, uh, my, actually, my, actually, my co worker, my, the other financial educator you see, um, his parents are bad. And there's a different code that shows up on the credit report. So we can see that it is not like that child, whenever they grow up and apply for credit, they have an awesome credit score. We can also see that it's not theirs, not their debt that they were responsible for. But the cool thing is, is that it's positive. If it's positive, that works for them. And if it's negative, at Education Credit Union, we ignore it. <laughs> and so as long as they have that particular code and they were not responsible for the debt. And so in that, but that is a possible thing. That is a really beneficial tool. That as long as the parents are responsible, because we've also seen it the other way, where the parents best of intentions, things happen. There's a gas card, there's a shell card, there's a whatever, and things happen. But as long as things are kept well, yes, it can really help them out. It won't necessarily, depending on the lender, financial institution, all those other qualifiers, won't necessarily hurt them, but can really help them. So yeah, that is a good thing. What else? Are you a lender at your job? No, my job is strictly financial educator and staff trainer and staff writer because I write the blog. But, but yeah, so but, but yeah, so no, we do not I do not lend. We we post classes for our lenders to teach them how to do this. Absolutely, I mean that's what I mean. When you said that, like for example, on the phone that she had borrowed it for her brother, mm -hmm. um that doesn't look negative to to you then? We question judgment, but really that just depends on the depends on your lender and the other questions that are asked. That's the thing is like to be taking on debt for what you do with your money is your business. Right. That's and if you're willing and responsible to take on that debt, and as long as there are no payments that are missed for that boat that's in her name that, that she doesn't pay for, cool. There are payments that are missed, and that's not her debt, but technically her debt, then I would, that would that would be just a question that does that if her credit inquiries are her missed payments or for other things that are her responsibility, <laughs> that's something else to be addressed, you know. Right. And so, and that's why your lender has those conversations. Again, 99% of people pay back their loans. All we're looking for is do you want to pay back your loan? And do you have the means to pay back your loan? Right. The only two questions we need to answer. Anything else? Yes, keep going. Uh, so on uh, you were you 
we're speaking that I know we might have a different class for this, but for the no thumb, down payment for it comes. Okay, so you see education credit union, we do conforming and not within, we do conventional loans predominantly. Um, there are programs that you can look into for home ownership that don't require a down payment. We do not affiliate ourselves with those. I just continue to you as cool to him, your new friend, not both his financial educator. Um, but there are different, the, a Seth Grant is S E T H, like the name Seth Grant. Um, that is a zero down payment program for homes. You have a fixed interest rate, which is a good thing. You don't want to go to school to create more interest. But anyway, um, that's um, but it's a fixed interest rate. It's going to be traditionally higher than market average, based still based on your credit score, like your credit score is low, and you know, you call your credit score will qualify you for the set grant. And then if it's a little on the high end, or you know, your interest rate needs to be on the higher end because of a lower credit score, then it will be higher fixed interest rate, but they'll give a good credit score, you qualify for the set grant, and your credit score is really good, and you're going to get their baseline bottom dollar interest rate, which is still fixed and still is going to probably be higher than market average, but it's fixed and you don't have to have a down payment. So yes, long term, your interest rate is higher, but you don't have to have a down payment, and but it's fixed interest rate, which means it's not going to change over time based on the market. If you're buying a home, Speaking, you want a fixed rate. What, part of what caused the crisis in like 2007, 2009 was adjustable rate mortgages. People got these really low interest rates, and then the market collapsed, and the interest rates grew, and then they couldn't afford their house. That's what happened. So you have a fixed rate, you don't have fixed rates. Oh, yeah. So, Seth Grant is a zero down payment program. There are several of them. Um, FHA loans, we again, we don't do FHA. Um, we do conventional loans predominantly, but FHA is a government program, first time homeowners. And it's a decreased down payment. So instead of needing like the 10, five, the 10 to 20%, depending on where you land, five, um, five, 10, 20%, instead of that, you can be as low as 3%. You have 3% of your home's down payment saved up, you might qualify for an FHA loan, depending on your credit score and other factors. So there are programs in place for people to buy homes. Um, outside of the conventional, like save up 10% for a down payment and then like go through the whole thing. Uh, there's room to move, but that's okay. Anything else? Yeah, um, just sort of going back to the whole, you know, I got a boat loan for my brother. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the ramifications of, uh, for instance, what if a year into that uh, loan, he dies then you're having to pay that, mm -hmm. or you, you get the boat back, or yeah, exactly. Because like, whenever that boat say that well, she bought that boat for the brother, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you bought your car for. I care that you borrowed money from me for the car. I care that you borrowed money from me for the boat. I don't care who it's for. I don't care as long as I have a payment in my inbox. And so, whoever was responsible for that. They can't afford to take out the loan on their own. They probably shouldn't have it. But if you're a generous enough person to offer it to somebody, you need to be prepared to take responsibility for that. Right? Sort of like, and it's you know, they're not willing to co-sign. <laughs> and that's the thing too. Is like, if they can qualify, but they need a co-signer. But if they can't qualify, you're to a point for a co-signer, and you're still going to get it for them. That's the risk that you put yourself. And so, again, at the end of the day, and you make the thing. If if Whenever you, if you are generous enough to do that for someone else, that's the question you need to ask. Should the world collapse? Should the world collapse and something terrible happen? Are you prepared to assume this debt? That's what you ask yourself when you become a co-signer, but you also ask yourself if you're just being generous. Okay, one yes, more. Um, re regarding the refinancing of the car loan and the house loan, um, just, just to make sure I understood. Refinance, we do have to weigh better scores. Yes. So, like I told, I told Garrett earlier, we were talking just chit chatting, and uh, our loan business is booming. And it seems counterintuitive because, you know, go. But, um, but that's the deal. That's what we mean by our loan business is booming is that the interest rates have fallen to the floor. And so, these people that had like five, six interest rates, five, six to seven, eight, nine percent interest rates on their homes. Well, now they have much better credit scores than they did 10 years ago. And now their interest rate, if they refinance, 
percent. So yeah, you go through in, when you refinance, you kind of sort of go through the whole process again. But now you're getting that new interest rate, and so that's all. That's that's what we mean by refinance. Is you're just going to reapply for the loan, but with these better terms. And yes, so when you always refinance, don't wait. Home. If you're in the mood, and it is a really good incentive, but there's like two percentage points depending on the depending on what it is. You have to make the right decision for yourself. But when it comes to refinancing, yes, when you have a better credit score and the interest rates are really low for those better credit scores, refinance is going to save you lots of money. Is that like a, is there like a year time frame for that? Or? No, you can raise you can and what you can do is you, every single financial institution, yours included, no matter where you bank, um, if our rates are posted, that's by law. Our interest rates, it's called regulation D. <laughs> And uh, we are legally required to tell you our interest rates in like any really good we require to post them on our website. So you can go and look. So you don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to, but you can call anywhere, see what their current interest rates are. And then if you have a superlative credit score, a really good one that you think you may qualify for this, oh, like I'm paying like 12% interest on my car, but if I refinance here, I can get it for six. Okay, well then it's worth a refinance. Like, you know. And so it just yeah, depends on what works for you. Um, some people are terrified of refinancing because then you do have to submit all the documentation on stuff again, like for a home and stuff. And so it can be a little tedious, but it can save you a lot of money in the long run. Home equity lines of credit are another popular thing um, where you borrow against the equity in your home. Equity is like, say you have your home for $120,000 and you pay on the principal $5,000 of debt now. Well, now you have $5,000 of equity. Like, you're only still a little bit. So you have $5,000 of equity in your home, and you can get a loan for that now. It's a home equity loan. It gets a secured loan. And when I say it's secured, that means there's something we can take. What do you think we take? Vague. Mm -hmm. So when HELOCs, home equity loans, or home equity lines of credit are generally secured, and but typically people who qualify for them have really good terms that work out. But that's the thing. HELOCs, home equity lines of credit, Else? <laughs> and it's still possible to, if you try to buy a home in the next month, it's still possible, isn't it? Yes. It's okay. So I think in Texas, real estate laws, like they require like 60 days, like just for things to brew and crossing. But like, so even if you have like $100,000 in your back pocket, like here, oh, about a $200,000 house, here's a check. If that's great. There's still like a 60 day period. But Yes, it is possible to do it within that time frame. I will tell you, when I bought my house, I did not expect to buy a house before I bought one. And so it was one of those things that everything sort of fell into place at the appropriate time and in the appropriate way. And then, yes, in 60 days, I got a call. But, um, but it is something that I, it's something that I always had sort of planned for in the back of my mind. So I was somewhat prepared. I'm not Stress really well, so it was a little daunting for me. But, but yes, after the end of that two months, which are just a blur in my memory, and you know, you end up with a home and it's fine. But it is, it is possible. But you know, usually not something that's a couple of months. All things fall in perfectly in line. Inspections go good, and you can consider them for your bond and stuff. Anything else? And if you have great credit, what does that mean? If you get great credit, if it's super, traditionally, say you have the pinnacle of credit, like an 850 or a 900, like you were there, you can get no higher. Um, it generally means guaranteed approval. Um, you will get special offers from your financial institution and other lenders just for really cool perks on cards and, uh, and on cards, not cards, but cards. Really cool perks like travel miles and da da based on how you spend and use your money. Um, and then again, when it comes to refinancing, basically your credit score. At its peak, we'll just get you the lowest interest rate and everything, and a few like social perks. Again, it's that, it's that weird like struggle. So you like try to do this thing, but then like you can do it seven hundred in a month, like six fifty in a month. You can do almost anything, but if you really want what's best for you, like if you want to get there to that eight hundred, that seven fifty to seven thirty range, you know, it's worth working for. At least save you some money. And then once you have your car, once you have a house that you need, like you get these benefits on top of these things. Yeah. Okay, this is awesome. All right. I'll see y'all next week. We're gonna have so much fun. Talk to you.
Retirement, yes, Kathleen. Retirement, I believe, and I'm passionate about retirement because I'm ready. <laughs> so, 